Hello everyone, and thanks for tuning into Get Us Where It's Sunny Roundup for April 2024. So here we go again, it's time to bring you more Sunny Roundup data. We're going to be looking at things like sea surface temperature anomalies, the QBO, the AO, the NEO, and more beside that. So sit back, relax, and enjoy, and I shall talk you through Get Us Where It's Sunny Roundup for April 2024. In a moment, just say we will not be including solar data in this sunny roundup, unusually so, but uh, it was only last Sunday, but we did uh, Solar Sunday on Easter Sunday. So uh, if you want to know uh, everything that's been going on uh, solar wise, then please check out last week's uh, Solar Sunday. The link to that is in the description with this video. I thought if we include solar data today, we'd just be repeating ourselves. Um, one week after Solar Sunday, so I hope that's all right with everybody. Uh, so yeah, please like, share, subscribe, and share everybody in for Doom. I just say that first video is our 6 a.m. UK weather forecast. We've also released my fifth summer update, and we're live at 6 p.m. with our 10 to 14 day, along, of course, by the way, uh, with some uh, long range as well. So I should see a little bit later on at 6 p.m. Right, well, let's do a sunny roundup there. We're going to be focusing a lot with this one on uh, El Nino and La Nina and all that kind of thing, actually. But we will look at the wider oceans as well. So this is how the oceans were looking when we did the last week, uh, last um, month's sunny roundup, I should say, for uh, March. Hold on. <coughs> Oh, sorry, everybody. This is how uh, the oceans were going to be the last month's sunny roundup for uh, March. We've got our four areas of interest, of course. We've got the uh, Enso region just here. We've got the northern and a particular focus on the northeast Pacific just there. Indian Ocean is over here. And the Atlantic Ocean is over there. Right, so that's how things were set up uh, last month. This is the very latest, as of the 5th of April. Let's deal with the Enso region first of all. So we still see an El Nino signature in the central and western portion of uh, the actual Pacific Ocean through here and also through here. We are starting to see a little bit of uh, cooling mode taking place towards the far eastern portion of the actual Pacific Ocean. That's relatively shallow water. That wouldn't necessarily say that uh, that's landing here on the way. But it is notable that things are beginning to get colder there just towards the eastern portion of the uh, of, uh, Peru, around the actual Pacific Ocean. Uh, not all that much in the way of cold and average sea surface temperature on down here. One of the things I do look for uh, before a La Nina is cold and average sea surface temperature that is gathering, you know, like off the coast of Chile. So around here, I'd expect that area to look a little bit colder if we was uh, going to flip into a strong uh, La Nina. Um, but it's a little bit on the cooler side through there. So don't get me wrong, it's a bit cooler through there. Um, otherwise, so, as I say, central western portion of the Enzo region still depicting like an El Nino signature. The cold PDO signature, that continues. So cold and average sea surface temperature lines remain through here in the uh, northeastern portion of the uh, portion of the Pacific Ocean and down towards uh, Hawaii, for example. Uh, over in the Indian Ocean, so let's compare that to uh, last month. <coughs> so, sorry, once again, everybody, let's compare that to uh, last month. Not much change, really, but I think we are starting to see warmer uh, knowledge beginning to uh, gather through here. But otherwise, I think we're in a relatively neutral phase in the Indian Ocean. And then, interestingly, over in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, so again, let's go back to uh, last month. Again, that's the setup last month. This is the situation this month. But not much change, but it remains very, very, very substantially warm and average here through the tropical and subtropical Atlantic Ocean. This, of course, is where we look to later on in the year, that continues into the summer and the autumn, uh, where we will be getting Atlantic uh, storms, tropical storms, and or hurricanes developing. You know, that's like the development region, uh, really. So, for example, Cabo Verde Islands just here. That's the development region, and we do see that it remains substantially warmer than average through there. Um, uh, if that carries on over the next few uh, months, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't, then 
uh, we could be in a bit of trouble, especially if we start getting La Nina going through here. If we start getting La Nina, cold event through there, a lot of these warm than average sea so temperature issues here, then we could see a lot of hurricanes. We may well have our first hyperactive hurricane season. Um, probably since 2020, I think. It is a little bit cooler through here. Towards the eastern sea, but the states, so it gets a bit warmer through here. So, again, we remain not all that far away from a tripod. Since you're what am I doing? So, uh, we remain not all that far away from a tripod. Since you're warmer through there, cooler through here, and then substantially warmer uh through there we would like to, to have a proper tripod since uh, i think we would like to see this area go warmer and this area actually go a little bit cold but we're not that far away from a uh tripod so how things are looking in terms of subsurface temperature along is at depth in the uh extra pacific ocean so with this you have to think that uh, this is like the surface just here of the uh, Pacific Ocean, well, Tour Pacific Ocean, uh, we've got Indonesia over there, and Peru with Paddington, of course, will be over here. Right, so we can see that at depth. We have got some quite cold subsurface temperature and ice gathering between around 100 and like 200, 250 metres. Also, just underneath the surface here, quite cold as well, uh, interestingly. So if we come back here, like this area, so that would be kind of here, I think. So this area looks relatively warm, but just, just, just underneath that, uh, there, I think it is quite cold. And I wouldn't be surprised in the next week or two if we see some of those cold average subsurface temperatures breaking to the top of the surface there. So that's going to be something to keep an eye on. This area just here over the next week or two may well start going cold as the cold of an average subsurface temperature will start breaking to the surface. And that's possibly the beginnings of that that we see uh, just there. So that does look quite landing yet, as I have to say. There is still a warm and average area just here through the central portion. So that would be like there. I suppose, uh, that kind of area. Um, but it looks quite, um, you know, it looks quite uh, swamped by these colder than average uh, temperatures here at depth and also almost breaking to the surface as well. That does look quite La Nina-esque, I have to say. It looks like it's going to start as an eastern sort of uh, La Nina over on this side, just here. Southern Oscillation Index uh, next. So the SY is measuring air pressure between Darwin and Tahiti. is isn't driving anything in its, ter in its own terms. It's just telling us what they're actually doing. And the SOI is in a negative uh, phase. Then uh, the atmospheric setup will be reflective of El Nino. When the SOI is in a positive phase, the atmospheric setup will be reflective of La Nina. Now, we also get some quite strong negativity of the SOI. So, it looks like El Nino, certainly from an atmospheric setup, is actually fighting back. Now, it wasn't that long ago we were getting some quite strong positivity. So, from around around the 14th of March, look, plus 18. 15th of March, look, plus 11. We've got the 19th, 20th, 21st, 22nd of March, all with positive numbers. That is atmospheric setups that are reflective of uh, La Nina. But as we come up here, the latest returns have actually been really quite negative. So uh, we've got the 30th of March, for example, at minus 10. We've got the 31st of March at minus 13. We've got the 1st of April at minus 10. We've got 2nd of April at minus 12. 3rd of April at minus 11. 4th of April at minus 12. And we've got the 5th of April at minus 16. And the 6th of April at minus 18. Goodness gracious me, getting more negative as that we're going along there. That tells me that El Nino is trying to fight back uh, a little bit. El Nino is trying to fight back. But I think the trend is going to be towards landing. And that's certainly what CFSB2 is uh, showing. So, uh, so with this, we've got the temperature on the side, just here, and the dates in monthly, period, monthly periods along the bottom. 
So the only important number is half a degree, either half a degree above average for El Nino or half a degree below average for La Nina. That's the only important number. CFSB2 with the black dashed line is predicting that we should reach La Nina threshold probably around June. Probably go in the central portion of the actual Pacific Ocean region 3.4. We probably go to uh one to um half a degree below average, colder than average sometime between May and probably more in towards June. By July, though, the CFS has us going down to, like, well, one and a half degrees above, uh, below average, I should say, into, you know, already into moderate landing and territory, and then becomes a strong landing event uh, as we go in towards the autumn. Very unsure about that. I think the CFS has got the direction of travel, right? CFS is normally pretty good with the direction of travel. So I think we will go into... And so neutral through the spring and then into La Nina through the summer. I would be surprised if it's as dramatic as that, given that El Nino is fighting back at the moment. And it's not that much in the way of cold now. We see some temperature, obviously, uh, every actual situation. I don't think this is going to be a quick flip, a rapid flip into uh, La Nina, such as the CFS show there. I think it will be a more gradual uh, transition and not as dramatic as that. So how are we comparing with previous years when we have gone from El Nino into La Nina? Let's have a quick comparison, shall we? This is the kind of thing we do in the winter updates, by the way. So if you like this kind of thing, then we do like a Sunday roundup every month where we do uh, this sort of in-depth look at the drivers and whatnot. But when we do our winter updates, which begin always be in the first Sunday of September, uh, we discard the Sunday roundups then. And, uh, and then we do, like, weekly updates uh, every week, right way through the autumn, from start of September to the end of November, building up to our winter forecast. And we look in-depth week by week by week and build up picture forensically. And we do these sort of comparisons. So if you like this kind of thing, make sure you're sub to our channel uh, because it will be in September that we begin our winter update. Seems a long way away now, but we will. It will come round. Very quickly, I promise you that. So, uh, so the, uh, within the archive here from Noah, we can go back to 1985. Now, the first time that we get a flip from El Nino to La Nina is 1987, 1988. So, this is the 5th of April. See, some temperature is from the 5th of April, 1988. Look how much further on and advanced the uh, La Nina was already at this point. In 1988, so that, that had a very quick flip into what became a uh, really strong uh, La Nina through uh, the spring of 1988. Much, much more of a La Nina signature, much more advanced with the cold event compared to what we see at those. So there's not really much comparison between the scenario now, where we probably are going into La Nina, but it's a much slower transition compared to 1988. That's a really bad time. You get a quick flip from El Nino into La Nina. It often turns out to be quite a poor northern and western European summer. That's a great example in 1988 of a quick flip with a bad summer. What about the next one? So the next one is 1995, interestingly. Uh, that also much more advanced with the uh, La Nina in the eastern portion. Anyway, it's still a bit of an El Nino signature from the central western portion. Uh, but overall, more advanced with the transition from El Nino to uh, La Nina compared to what we see uh, currently there. That actually, although it looks as though that's quite well advanced, what happened in 1995 is that the La Nina transition kind of stalled a little bit and it was actually quite a slow transition that year into uh, in, into uh, the cold event. So that coincided with a very hot and dry drought summer in uh, Northern Europe as well. What about the next one? Uh, the next comparison, I should say. Uh, so we've got, uh, oh yeah, I'll just close down. Blow and bother. I'm going to pause the video. Hang on. There we go, for a cupboard situation. The next one is... That's the only problem with these comparisons. You can't accidentally shut down the tap. So, uh, the next one is 1998. The next time we go from El Nino to La Nina is in uh, 1998. Up a Super Nino, of course, of, uh, of 97, 98. 
Now, this one is very interesting and really different. So, the cold of an average... So, we still, at this point in uh, 1998, we still have a very strong El Nino signature through the eastern portion of the Ento region. And the La Nina is actually... Now, the La Nina signature is actually more in the western portion of the Equatorial Pacific Ocean. So, I mean, it swings the roundabouts, isn't it? But uh, that's perhaps one of the years that is closer to the current scenario, just in that it was a slightly slower transition. <coughs> Excuse me, it was a slightly slower transition from El Nino to uh, La Nina. But then again, it, it became quite a quick flip as we got into the summer anyway. But that one's doing things a little bit different and quite unusual for... Because normally it would be like this area, but would cool first. So for it to be the western uh, Equatorial Pacific Ocean that cools first and the eastern Equatorial Pacific Ocean hangs on to the El Nino season, that is quite unusual. I think, for an El Nino to uh, La Nina type scenario. Right, so there we go there. Let's push that along. The next one, you had a little sneak peek of it a moment ago, is 2007. Again, look how much, and this is much more typical for it to be the eastern portion of the Enzo region that's cooling down. Look how much further on and how much further advanced the La Nina signature is already by this point in the 5th of April. So I know a lot of you have been worrying that the summer of 2024 is going to be a repeat of uh, summer 2007, which of course is the washout summer. Absolutely atrocious summer with flooding rains from uh, May through to July. I mean, that could still happen. No, <laughs> I will put that on the table. It could still happen. But from a La Nina perspective... I don't see a great deal of comparison, really, between the change that's going on at the moment from El Nino towards a more La S-type signature and this point in 2007. Obviously, at this point in 2007, the flip was well and truly underway, and it was a very, very quick and very, very rapid flip that we had in um, 2007 from uh, from El Nino to La Nina. So, yes, we could still get a washout summer. I wouldn't completely ruled out. But, um, you know, <laughs> from a La Nina perspective, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be uh, a great deal of comparison between 2024 and uh, 2007. Uh, and then the final time we went from El Nino to La Nina was in 2010. I think this is perhaps the year that we're closest to, to be honest. What do you mean about that, everybody? 2010. Oh, obviously you're never going to get a complete direct light for light comparison. The Pacific overall, you know, the wider Pacific Ocean was colder in 2010, stronger cold PDO signature to what we've currently got. But I think out of all of the years, probably 2010 is the closest. Notice uh, in 2010 at this point, we still have an El Nino signature here, particularly through the section the eastern portion of the actual Pacific Ocean. We do see cold of an average sea surface temperature is gathering here. That's what I talked about, you know, off the coast of uh, Chile. It, we are seeing some slightly colder areas just begin to appear off the coast of Peru, but generally still with a relatively uh, La Nina S type, uh, El Nino S type signature, I should say, there at this point in 2010. I think out of all of those years from 1987 88, which was the first year we looked at flipping from El Nino to La Nina through to uh, 2010, um, oh, 910, which again is going from El Nino to La Nina. I think that is, is, is the closest to the current scenario. Please let me know what you think in the comments, everybody. Now, 2010 had a very hot June, actually. It's a front load of summer with a very warm, hot June into the beginning of July, say hot, then gradually deteriorated, finished up with a cool and wet August. You never get a complete light for light match, so we've got to get that on the table, um, but from a landing or from an intro perspective, I think, um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that uh, 2010 is the closest match there. I say, please let me know in the comments, everybody, what you think. And again, if you enjoy this kind of analysis, you know, comparisons and getting really in depth into things, and this is what we do every week during uh, the autumn with our 
winter update. So these 30 rounds are kind of like a little preview, if you like, for what's happening later on in the year. Uh, right, so we're moving on to the QBO uh, next. This is from uh, NASA. So with this, you have to think that these are the levels of the atmosphere from the stratosphere and stratosphere up here. 10 HPA to the troposphere, 30 to 50 HPA just there. The colours there are indicating the western and eastern QBO phases. So we have been in, a, in an eastern QBO phase, of course, in the middle of uh, last year. This blue-green area here descending from the stratosphere down into the troposphere is the easy phase of cross iberian oscillation we see the next westerly qbo phase lurking up here at the top of the atmosphere in the strat there and that westerly qbo phase is likely to start descending as we uh, go through this summer we think that the summer of 2024 is going to be a descending uh, westerly QBO summer and certainly by so this is more of a winter driver than a summer driver to be honest with QBO but we do look at it year round so the winter of 2024-25 the next winter is likely to be a westerly QBO winter we look at the QBO because when you're in a westerly QBO you're kind of um, increasing or enhancing the strength of the total west is converge when you're in an easy QBO you're weakening the total west is so uh, and it's crude it's like an easy QBO increases your chance of a cold winter, but there are many easy QBO winters, but at my own, just like the one just gone. Um, and there are some Western QBO winters that are cold, for example, uh, the December to remember, December 2010 was a Westerly QBO winter. QBO number is in uh, now for uh, last month. So this is the QBO index going all the way back to the 1950s from now. If we come down to here, we can see that uh, March's QBO number came out minus 28.56. Very, very strong EC QBO. That will probably be uh, that will probably be the peak, I think, of this EC QBO actually. Now notice we begin 2023 with positive numbers. That's the last Westerly QBO phase, of course. That reverses into the summer. The numbers quickly start going negative and become more negative as the year goes on. By the winter of 2023-24, we are into a strong easterly QBO phase into minus 20s. So January at minus 24.56, February at minus 25.54, and then I say March at minus 28.56. I think that will probably be the peak of uh, this easy QBO. I think March will be like the peak uh, month of the easy QBO. And I would imagine sort of April, May, We'll start to see the uh, ECQBO beginning to come down, but it's still quite negative. And then into June, July, we probably uh, start reverting closer to neutral. July, August, somewhere around there uh, is where I think we will see our first positive month, our first West ECQBO, maybe August, most likely. To do that, so this summer should be the summer that sees be a summer that sees reversal from um, the uh, EC to the Westerly QBO phase. And we did look at, by the way, uh, we looked at the QBO in the fourth summer update a couple of weeks ago. And if you want to know, you know what summers are like uh, historically that are transitioning from an easterly to a westerly QBO phase, then please check out the fourth summer update that we released a couple of weeks ago. Uh, right, Arctic Oscillation uh, next. The AO Observer Forecast is looking like this. Remember, the Arctic Oscillation is an index that's uh, reflecting the atmospheric state. It's not driving anything in its own terms. It just tells what the atmosphere is doing. So when the AO is in its positive phase, we've got low pressure up over the Arctic of the Pole. When the uh, AO is in negative phase, we've got high pressure blocking over the Arctic, um, over the North Pole. So through, uh, the, uh, through much of March, actually, the Arctic Oscillation was in a negative phase. So uh, we did have quite a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, blocking over the Pole during uh, March and into the beginning of April as well. Despite that, we actually had an exceptionally mild uh, March. It's just going to show what I always say. You know, you can have all the blocking in the world, but it's going to, got to be in the right place to deliver cold conditions. And obviously the blocking wasn't in a, in a position to deliver cold to western parts of Europe. Anyway, the current situation, that was just here around uh, around neutral, so the Arctic Oscillation and the GFS ensembles, the red lines up here, are uh, indicating that the AO is going to go into a much more 
strongly positive phase, actually, as we're going uh, through this April. So this looks like it's going to be a positive AO month, telling us that we're going to lose a blocking, at least for the next couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to get low pressure up over the Arctic and over pole and that could be a signal for more in the way of westerly winds particularly if the elio is uh, positive which is indicated to be going positive as well so again uh, the black line shows where we've been with the north atlantic oscillation Red lines at the end with GFS on some of the forecasting NEO to go. Currently, we are really quite negative with the uh, NEO, quite interesting. Um, but we are going to see the NEO going into a much more positive phase as we get towards the middle and uh, second half of April. There, maybe it's just a prediction, though, so could be wrong. But most of the GFS ensembles are going in that direction. Now, this is a signal for westerly uh, winds, really, and, and a strengthening of the uh, westerly flow. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be unsettled, though, because in a westerly flow, especially as we're going towards the summer, we could see a strengthening of the Azores high. If we start getting the Azores high, ridging in from the southwest, that can be a signal for dry weather, especially for the south, and also quite warm or even, you know, very warm conditions. And that particularly as we go into the uh, summer uh, right, so Eurasian snow cover. We see the snow line beginning to pull back from the west, uh, from the west of uh, Russia. Although most parts of Russian Siberia are still well and truly covered with snow, as you'd expect in early April. And interestingly, large portions of uh, of uh, Scandinavia and uh, Nordic regions are still covered. So you see most of Finland covered with snow. But large portions of Sweden, away from far south, still covered with snow. Quite a bit of Norway is still covered with snow as well. It was a very long and cold Scandinavian and Nordic winter. And uh, that is continuing to some degree, especially in more central and northern regions, not quite as much um, in, in, in southern regions. And then we see most of Europe, away from mountainous areas, uh, you know, like the Alps, the Pyrenees and whatnot, most of Europe is snow-free, though, away from the Scandinavian Nordic area. And that has been something that we've seen through uh, a, a large portion of the winter, just like it was a very, very poor winter across most parts of Europe, away, as I say, from Scandinavia and Nordic regions for snow cover. So a little bit of a strange winter, how, you know, in the extreme north, it was actually really quite a cold winter, certainly December and January, anyway, not necessarily February, but certainly December and January, very cold and snowy in, in like, Norway, Sweden, Finland, um, those areas, but anywhere further south than like Denmark, uh, generally had a very or west, uh, you know, generally had a very mild uh, winter. So, so quite a quite an odd winter. And then lastly, this uh, study roundup, we've got uh, Arctic sea ice extent. We've just passed the uh, maximum, of course, for uh, the Arctic sea ice extent. So you see here how this blue line just starting to tick down a little bit. That tells us that we have passed the maximum for this uh, season. How are we looking compared to um, our most recent averages? So well, let's put in 20, uh, 11 to, 20, uh, to 2020 average. So we're slightly above that, uh, our most recent 10 year average. You can see how the blue line there, slightly above uh, our most recent 10 year average, although ticking down again closer to the more recent 10 year average, 2011. 2020 if we put in 0110 so with that we've been very close to that 10 year average 2001 2010 slightly under it now but uh we have been quite close to that average over the past few weeks 91 to 2020 we're under that uh, 10 year average of course and then we have got 1979 to 1990 uh, and significantly under that 10-year average. Of course, right, let's see how we're looking compared to recent years. So compared to last year, we have actually got more Arctic size, uh, Arctic size you know, a greater Arctic size extent this year compared to 2023, quite significantly so, actually. We're above 2022 as well. Uh, we're above 2021, well above 2020. Uh, well above 2019 as well. So we're not doing too badly, you know, compared to the recent uh, years. Anyway, uh, 2018, we're well above that year for Arctic Sea Ice Extent as well. About 2017, which we're above. 2016, above that year. 
Of course, what this doesn't tell us is how thick the ice is, though. So, although we have got a relatively decent extent, certainly compared to recent years, um, it might be very, very thin and flimsy, which is why we're already starting to see quite a significant, you know, tick down in the blue line there. Anyway, we're above 2015 at this point. What about 2014? So, we're on a par with 2014. That's the first year that we're actually at parity with at this point. Uh, 2013... Third shot of power back, just ever so slightly under it. Um, 2012, which of course became... So this just goes to prove that whatever's happening at the moment doesn't really tell you a great deal about what about what's going to happen uh, for the melt season, you know, when we reach the minimum level in uh, September. Because at this point in 2012, which is the record minimum year, or became the record minimum year, at this point we're actually a little bit under 2012 for our Arctic size extent. That's the first year we've seen that we have uh, less Arctic sea ice than um, but nevertheless, 2012 did become a record bit of year. So that just goes through, but what's going on right now doesn't really tell you a great deal about what, what it's going to be looking like in, uh, in, 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 in September. That's 2011, which we've been above throughout the whole season for Arctic Science extent. We're now very close to that year. 2010, we're under 2010. We're very close to 2009, slightly under it. Slightly under 2008, uh, ahead of, though, of 2007, uh, and ahead of 2006 as well. Quite interesting. A um, little bit ahead of 2005. We're quite a long way back now, aren't we? So, you know, this is really interesting stuff, I think, anyway. Um, 2004, very close to that. Birch on parity with it, slightly under. Uh, 2003, now we're significantly under that year. And 2002, we're very close to 2002. Under 2001, uh, under 2000 as well. Now we're moving back into the colder era, of course. 1999, we're under that year. 1980, 1998, we're under uh, that year. We're under 1997. We're very close to 1996 again, which is quite interesting. Uh, 1995, so uh, we're a little bit under that year. Not great, sort of, though. Uh, that's, you know, coming up for, what, 30 years ago? Um, no, very interesting, I think this is. Anyway, let me know the comments what you think. 1994, quite a bit under that year. 93, we're under that year as well. 92, you know, all of these years now, we're going to be under 1991. 1990, not greatly though, under 99, but we are under it. Um, 1989, I mean, we're quite close for Arches, it's to 1989. 1988, we're under that year. 1987, under that year, get rid of that. 1986, we're under 1986. Finally, where are we going? 1985, under 1985, 1994, under that year. 1983, under that year, 1982, 1981, not greatly under 1981, but we are under it, 1980, and finally 1979, so all of those years, you know, from, uh, certainly from the mid-90s onwards, we are significantly uh, under. Right, well, if you enjoy this, as I say, this is what we do with our winter updates. So, the Sunday rounds are kind of like a little preview for the winter updates uh, that will be starting up in September. Hopefully, fingers crossed, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to do another season of winter updates in September. So, uh, if you found this, you know, through YouTube search, and this is the kind of thing you enjoy in-depth look at the big drivers of the weather, then please give us a sub. We will be doing another Sunday roundup in May, the first Sunday in May, which I think is going to be the 5th, maybe. I could be wrong, but I think that's going to be the 5th of May. Um, so we will include solar data with that, which of course we haven't included in uh, in this one, which is why I've been able to go a little bit more in depth because we haven't had solar to look at. So if you want to know about solar, solar as I say, check out Solar Sunday that we released last week on Easter Sunday. But if this is the kind of thing that you enjoy, then please make sure you're subbed to the channel, and we will do the Sunday roundups once a month, once a month, every month. From from right now, right way through to August, and then and then and then and then, and then 
and get started September, that's when we will go weekly with our winter updates, doing all of this kind of thing, comparisons, you know, and, 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 and going really in-depth into the drivers of the weather. Right, so that's your Sunday Rounder for April 2024. Thank you so much, everyone. Please drop a comment, let me know what you think. And also, don't forget to tell friends about Gals Web is the work we're doing here on the channel. Thank you so much, everyone, for doing that. Check out the summer update as well. It's a really fun update looking at March to summer data. And we're going to be live at 6 p.m. So if you've got any questions about this Sunday Roundup or about the summer update, then please uh, hold fire summer live stream at 6 and I will endeavour to answer your questions uh, there. We will be doing a 10 to 14 day in that live stream and showing you some long range too as it is a Sunday live stream so I've got to show you some long range uh, and that's coming up as I say from 6pm. For the Sunday roundup for April 2024 that's all for now and thanks for watching.